Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I am your host, Mark Birdie, the content marketing expert, bringing you three new episodes each week where I and top-level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success listeners. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. Productivity is something that I feel like all of us are after. We all want to accomplish more of our goals. We all want to get more of our work done. We all want to spend more time with the people who are important to us. We all have different reasons for productivity, but I feel like we all want it more. So when it comes to productivity, having a personal time management system uh, that you design for your schedule and getting everything you want out of your day is really important. And today's guest, he's going to talk with us about that. He is the founder and CEO of Triber, the social network for content creators that sends millions of monthly visitors to its members. He is a high energy speaker who blends original research into customer loyalty with a delivery of a stand up comedian. He is the creator of Insane Loyalty, an original framework which reveals that brands and cults use the same techniques to recruit their most loyal fanatics. He and his startup have been have appeared in publications like Venture Beast, Forbes, Yahoo News, Business Insider, and Inc. Magazine. He's spoken or consulted for a variety of companies and audiences, including IBM, Rutgers University, Vocus, New Media Expo, 140 Conf, and many others. Today's guest for episode 278 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Dino Dogan. Dino, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Mark, I could only hope to match your energy, my friend. Thank you for having me. And just a small correction, I'm no longer uh, the CEO uh, of Triber. We got acquired back in 2015, uh, and I've been out since uh, sometime in March 2016. So, But everything else is pretty on the money, and thanks for having me on the show, man. Do you know it's a pleasure to have you on the show? My apologies on that. Uh, oh, will, no worries. I will definitely uh, make sure that's different in the show notes. Um, but <laughs> I wanted to give credit where credit is due. Charlie is the new CEO. He's doing a, a bang up job over there. Uh, that's uh, that's good to hear. So um, again, thank you for coming on the show. I'm really happy to have you on. So I feel like we have a lot of important topics to talk about today. Uh, but first, I'd like to get a little background. I know you have a book, Gears of Reality. And I'm wondering why you decided to write that book and if you could give us some background on it. Ha, 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 great question. I've been trying to complete a manuscript for a good part of the last decade. And, uh, you know, my the first book I tried to write was on dog training. The next one was about God knows what. <laughs> uh, there's been few in between that uh, I've never managed to quite complete. Um, but this one came together, and I think it came together because it was embodied in the experience. Um, uh, the book is essentially about the uh, strategy that I executed at Spoiled Media um, in 2017, going into 2018 a little bit. Uh, so, you know, we took about a dozen people. We uh, set up a custom scrum uh, schedule for them. And um, and tested it out against reality, if you will. And uh, uh, the lessons that I've learned through that process, I thought were important and significant enough to sort of put them in one spot and make them known to others. And because we abstracted at the level of analysis of time or time management, there was nothing like that would preclude me from discussing what we've done because of an NDA or something like that. Um, and so um, last year, I guess around this time, um, October, November time frame, I sat down uh, to um, sort of reflect on what we've done. 
And that's how the book came about. It was just how do we manage our time better? Where does our time go? If Elon Musk has the same 24 hours, how is he able to run multiple successful companies and the rest of us can barely manage one? It's like, what's the guy's secret? I was trying to figure that out, and Gears of Reality is my best guess. So that's sort of how it came about. And it's interesting you mentioned that story because I feel like, again, like a lot of us are really into getting more productive. Some people are doing like a lot of research on it. Others, they're not doing so much research, but they definitely want to know how to be more productive. And one of the things that I came across in your book, something I found very shocking is something you mentioned, the 16 hour work week. And I've heard a lot of different uh, opinions about how long we should be working. I know Gary Vaynerchuk says 16 hours per day, but the 60 hour work week, I like to dive a little deeper into that. Uh, like how is that sustainable for people who are interested in it? And what do we need to know to have our own 16 hour work week? Yeah, so anyone listening, uh, it's important to know that what we're saying is 16 hour uh, work week, not 60 yes, good hour, good not six zero. yeah. Uh, you know, Mark, uh, so uh, after I sold Triber, um, around the same time, uh, I, I turned 40. And you sort of look back and you ask yourself, how much time do you want to spend uh, for the next, say, 40 years working, you know? And for some people, you know, the answer may be, you know, 40 hours a week is the only game in town. Um, others, 60 uh, um, hours is what they need to put in. Um, that's what they're doing. Uh, there's, if, you're, if you're fortunate enough to be able to set your own schedule um, and what's even more difficult, stick to it, um, then thinking about it in sort of long term uh, becomes paramount. Um, and, uh, Mark, you're very young. Uh, good for you. Uh, I remember being in my twenties and thirties, uh, energy up the wazoo. Right. Yeah. Um, but as we get older, our energy decreases, uh, significantly and we have to account for that. And we're not going to outrun it or outlast it. We can try and stay in shape. We can try to do things to stave off, let's say old age or, lower energy or however you want to conceptualize it. But you want to ask yourself how important is, say, work to you for the rest of your life? How important is making money uh, uh, to you for the rest of your life? And uh, uh, for me, the answer was I wanted to uh, give myself uh, more to artistic endeavors and uh, work a lot less. And about four hours per day is what I figured what most people in my situation were sort of, you know, uh, attached to a computer, designers, coders, etc. I think a lot of us have about three or four really good hours when you're in sort of a flow state um, to, to do the work, the most important work that you want to do. Uh, and you squeeze them into those uh, uh, four hours. And the rest of the time, if you, you know, if you end up doing some other stuff, that's great. That's gravy. Um, but what's the most important? And so in terms of the tempo, it was a good choice for me. But in terms of uh, someone who's working, let's say, 40 hours a week, uh, I, I wish I did this earlier. I wish I designated some 16 hours per week as more important than the other hours. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Well, so that uh, I can put the important work into those 16 hours and the other hours can be sort of, you know, kind of work that, you know, it's answering various emails and less, uh, less say, impactful work, uh, so to speak. So it, it's just good to understand uh, it's about energy and flow, right? At what time during the day, on average, am I most high energy and is easiest for me to enter the flow state, right? You ask yourself that question. And for me, the answer is 
I can enter that state on most days for about three or four hours and then I'm done. Uh, and so then the question becomes, what do you put into those three or four hours? And the answer is the most important stuff for me, uh, as it, I think should be for a lot of people. So, so on one hand, it's sort of a time management technique that uh, looks to the next 40 years. What's sustainable? What can we do for the next 40 years? On the other hand, hey, listen, you want to work 60 hours a week, six zero. Um, be my guest, but you still have to figure out what kind of work is most important to you. And you still have to figure out at what time of day is your energy and flow the best. And presumably you wouldn't want to match those two um, to coincide as to when you actually do that work. So the, that's the kind of thinking that led into this. And James Maynard Keynes, the economist, wrote a paper back in 1930 that talked about a 15-hour work week. I didn't know this at the time. But um, he predicted a lot of leisure uh, that would be brought about by technology. And that reminded me of the promise that technology made to me when I was in seventh grade, to everybody else too, more leisure. Um, and, you know, along the way, I've sort of reflected and uh, uh, realized that the leisure is nowhere to be found. Uh, the technology didn't bring about the leisure, if anything else, um, it took it away. But we now have an opportunity to reclaim that. And I found, I don't know about you, Mark, I'd be really curious to understand your point of view on this. Um, because you were born into digital, I transitioned into digital, right? And as I transitioned into digital along with the rest of my generation, we didn't care. We didn't know what to look out for. We weren't ready for Googles and Facebooks. We weren't ready for the kind of, for the news feeds. We weren't ready for the kind of things that they would do to our brains. Um, but now we have an opportunity to sort of, you know, create our own little filter bubble and moderate what comes in and out uh, and all of those things. And I think that's a more responsible approach rather than sort of gorging all you can eat feast of information mm. that's out there. So, you know, it's it's a lot of these sort of uh, trends that are happening. Uh, and and uh, a book was a response uh, in order to try to deal with some of those trends, such as, you know, just insane amount of information that's flowing at us any second. So that's a long winded answer. Sorry. Oh, no, no worries. And I mean, with the outflow of information, I mean, like we have so much knowledge that we can very easily acquire at our fingertips. Uh, just a quick thing, because I know you asked a little bit about my perspective. I yeah, like, please. I, I mean, I feel like I like <clears throat> like I feel like I was completely ready for Facebook and Twitter in the sense where like I was the digital age. Uh, but with the information, I feel like a big problem is uh, implementing the information where I feel like we can very easily drown ourselves in information, but if you do that, you can't take any action. So like even with this podcast episode, as much as I love it for you to listen to all 278 of these, I know you got to take action eventually. So uh, just make sure you're able to balance the information intake with the ability to implement. Yeah, great point. And um, like one of the things that I feel like is key for implementation, this is something that Dino touches in very nicely in his book, is the power of uh, building a team around your efforts. So I'm wondering if you could share with us how you're able to find the right people for your team, because you have like very detailed pictures and visuals of like what that structure looks like. But uh, how do we find people first? Ooh, that's a deep question. Um, uh, I'm tempted to say that uh, in some sense, you're not finding them, they're finding you. It certainly feels that way to me. Um, uh, Spoiled Media is the company that's uh, featured in the book. Uh, Pavel and Danny are the co-founders. And um, they're somebody that I've known for years. Uh, and at some point, you know, we've stayed in touch. At some point, they needed to optimize their operations. At some point, they realized that they've uh, gotten it as far as they could 
and they're running a creative uh, marketing agency in New York City. Uh, they felt they they felt they needed to do something. And so what they did, they've hired me to, you know, cause I've been there and done that in, in the sense that, um, I have a, a lot of bad operational karma to make up for. And I know where all the mistakes and landmines and dead bodies are buried. And so uh, second time around, third time around, you can, uh, attempt to avoid those. And that's, that's why they brought me in, and, uh, and we started working on. So, so they kind of they found me, and then what we've done with the um, uh, the um, sombrero strategy, and that's something that's in the book. I don't know if you got that far, um, but it defines the roles for the twelve people, uh, and this is a little bit weird. So, the roles are defined in uh, in some broad sense. As in, we need a creative individual here. We need a conscientious, logistically div, uh, driven, um, highly organized individual here, right? So it's sort of a left brain, right brain type of division, um, and then putting them into uh, teams of about three and a half, and um, understanding exactly what kind of things they need to do within their 16 hours that move the business needle forward and have those things sort of on the lockdown, uh, a clear game plan, uh, the pseudo code, as we call it. Uh, it's just a list of to-do tasks, you know? Um, the ideal being is, let's say you, Mark, uh, you want to step into one of these positions. You have an employee handbook. You go through it along with, say, three hours of training or something like that. You're ready to do the job as long as you know how to like click around and use the internet, et cetera. So, so it was a lot of um, abstracting at the proper level of analysis in order to understand what type of uh, individuals we need to be on the lookout for. And what's great is that if you encourage people to either be more creative or to be more, uh, let's say, uh, organizationally driven, uh, people naturally take to those things. Um, so, so finding um, employees who sort of fit those molds um, hasn't been that hard because nearly everybody fits one of those two to some extent. So that that's that's some of our thinking uh, around it. And then, of course, you know, there's the realities of execution, such as uh, what talent pool are we pulling from. And with us, it's uh, we're lucky. We're in New York City. There's, um, you know, I think over 200 colleges in New York City or something like that. Um, so lots of young people uh, coming out, graduating, looking for work. Very bright, very talented, um, very high energy. So we're sort of tapping into all of that. So I hope that ties it all together somehow. Yeah, I mean, a lot of great insights. And again, I like that sombrero strategy. Like, I mean, it's different from like a pyramid in the sense where like you just keep building uh, new layers on the pyramid. But instead, you've got this uh, horizontal approach where you have like um, a less of a hierarchy and like a more tight knit uh, community. So again, like a lot of these pictures are really nicely laid out in Dino's book, Gears of reality but one of the things that you mentioned in the book um is uh well actually a piece of advice uh outsource what is not core to the company delegate what is not core to you i think in that quote you can see how you can have the 16 hour uh one six hour work week even if uh like right now you may not see it as a possibility like uh again that theme of building a team but uh, how do we determine what is core to us and what we should be doing with our 16 hours? Hmm. Yeah, another great question. Um, reflection, meditation is the only way, I think, because uh, it's hard to figure out. You know, it's, it's not something that's easy. So uh, I'm a huge fan of meditation. The, answer is on the, the answers are on the inside. Um, as it were. So 
it's some of the uh, uh, best revelations that have come to me have come to me uh, during meditation. There's one, in fact, that I'm thinking about right now uh, that has to do with Maiden NYC and our pivot next year, uh, where we're seriously considering uh, how, how do I uh, it's even hard to say it. Um, let's let, let's say deprecating uh, customer service arm entirely. So imagine that. Imagine uh, a business without customer service. That barely makes any sense. But uh, if you look at the core operations and you try to become good at that one thing that it, that that you know that is unique to you and you're uniquely capable of executing that, that is your unfair advantage, then everything else, even customer service, becomes something that's a cost center, so to speak. Um, And it's unique to every company. So it's one of those things where you really have to understand yourself. And the only way to get there is uh, a reflection Uh, And then, of course, extrapolate that to your business. And hopefully you'll come up with some answer and it'll probably be wrong. And then, you know, you rinse and repeat. Uh, Maybe like 100 answers from now, you'll start approaching the right answer. And that's how you (laughs) ultimately narrow it down. And I mean, a lot of this is reflective. It is deep thought. I mean... Uh, like Dino shared a lot of great points, but in the end, you have to really think about that and know for yourself, what are some of my unique strengths? What are some of the things that I can do that only I should be doing some things that I'm strong at? So uh, that meditation is definitely a um, <clears throat> factor. I do have two quick questions for you, Dino, because uh, meditation is a very interesting topic in the Gaberti family. So uh, I, do <laughs> not, I do not meditate. My brother mm-hmm. meditates every single day at least once a day, sometimes twice. Uh, So two super quick questions. Uh, One, how do you meditate if you do not meditate at all? And two, would you count running by yourself as meditation? Uh, Second question first, yes. Uh, I love my meditative runs uh, uh, time. So um, I count that as meditation. Uh, the purpose of meditation is to take on the point of view of what the Buddhists call the observer. It's that voice inside your head, and maybe it's uh, whoever's operating the voice uh, inside your head and, and further and further inside. Uh, the point of which is to sort of um, have a distance and a detached, emotionally detached um, point of view on the circumstances. It's the most difficult thing you can do. I mean, how do you detach your emotions? You know, um, it's, a, it's a hard thing to uh, do in the moment you think you've done it. You're probably wrong. Um, but taking that detached perspective, um, there's, a, there's a Buddhist story about this. Uh, Uh, It goes, I'll be quick. I'll make it uh, real short. It's something like um, there's a white rag and it's uh, uh, dipped into red dye and you take out the white rag and you squeeze it out, rinse it out and you maybe wash it and it's back to white, you know, and then you do it again, uh, dip it into red dye. You take it out, you rinse it, you wash it, you dry it. And now it's starting to take on a little red hue. Well, you do this five or 10 or 50 times. And after a while, that white rag becomes red, even after washing. And that's the point of meditation. It's to find that space inside your mind that you can um, have some sort of detached point of view on circumstances and then take it with you wherever you go. Um, that's, that's the best thing about meditation as far as I'm concerned. That, that state of mind stays with you even, if, uh, even when you're in the hustle and bustle of New York City. And let me tell you, that's the spot where you need it the most. <laughs> so so it's, I'm just a huge fan. Um, I, would, uh, I would recommend it. 
Well, I'm happy to hear running counts as meditation because I run very frequently. Uh, but I've always heard about the benefits of meditation. Um, and it's very powerful just to be able to like take a pause um, and being really able to uh, just take a little break from the hustle and bustle that's going on. So uh, meditation, definitely something I've always heard a lot of uh, really good things about. Uh, one of the things that I also want to ask you is that, I mean, I feel like as I mentioned in the beginning, so many people care about their productivity, whether it's they passionately think about it every day or if it's a little more subtle. Uh, but what do you believe holds most people back from being able to uh, achieve productivity and uh, accomplish their goals? We don't know what we need to be productive about. It's, you know, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've been guilty of it. Uh, it's the nature of our times that uh, we equate busyness with productivity. Uh, the hardest thing is to know um, what to spend time on. And uh, what should you be actually producing, you know? Because, um, you know, Mark, you're not producing a podcast, as you very well know this. Sure, you're producing a podcast, of course. Um, but the podcast is an expression of a deeper desire, need, want, whatever it is, right? Um, and the layers run deep. And so to find some kind of a foundational layer is the uh, most difficult thing. However, um, I, I can point to the listener in the right direction. You're probably going to find that thing that you're supposed to be productive about in your childhood and probably in arts. And so if you find something like that, and God forbid, you can also make a living at it, that's the way to do it. Um, the other stuff is, you know... Um, it's a uh, productivity akin to something like masturbation or something like that productivity for the sake of productivity. This seems like a waste of time to me. Um, but yeah, finding what you need to be productive about and what it is that you're actually trying to produce at the most foundational level of analysis. That's the tricky bit. Do you know that's a really awesome analysis? And I mean, it really expands on this concept that I feel like a lot more people know about, which is um, being busy is not the same as being productive. So you just go around doing all these different things, like classic example, responding to emails uh, may not necessarily be productive if you're in that inbox too long and not doing some of the bigger things. But I mean, I feel like your analysis, it's another dimension of this because there are people who they feel like they're being productive. They feel like they're doing the right things, but they're not necessarily uh, moving the ball forward. It's pursuing all these different ideas without really sticking with a few of them and really letting them build. So uh, not being pro productive just for the sake of being productive, uh, finding those like few things you can do, really just honing in on them instead of pursuing every new project in the name of productivity. Yeah. And, you know, and even that is totally fine. Right. We just have to go through these phases where uh, when, uh, at one point you're binging on experiences and on another um, point down down the road, perhaps you are, you know, purging what's valuable from those experiences um, and what's not valuable from those ex experiences. And then you just start having more of those valuable experiences once you figure out what those are, particularly if you uh, inject meditation between binge and purge. You'll figure that out. So uh, in terms of mechanically how it might work, that's how it works for me. And I know you've had a lot of experiences throughout your journey of founding Triber, uh, going on to write your book, Years of Reality. And I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff that's been happening as well. So uh, with that in mind, I'm wondering if you could share with us one big challenge you faced in your journey and a powerful lesson you learned during that challenge. Uh, you know, if you're going to label yourself an entrepreneur and quit your job and go uh, do something new, uh, like starting a company or something like that, um, the knowledge gap that I had to close was just the size of Grand Canyon. So I went uh, about and I read uh, just, you know, uh, an insane number of business books. And um, what I realized about the business books is, is that, that were, you know, and now we're talking, you know, books that were 
done in like say early 2000s and before you know so 90s 80s some even as far back as like like the old school guys like zig ziglar and um dale carnegie etc what i've realized is that uh, those books provided a certain uh, type of information that was on one hand important so i don't want to take anything away from these books these uh, business books that are available on like Amazon, you know, these guys that are writing them are just brilliant dudes who, you know, understand what's what. Um, but what I found them, and I think the timing had everything to do with this, and I'll explain why in a second, but what, uh, what I found is that they were wholly inadequate uh, for the problems that I was dealing with. The actual problems that I was dealing with were at a lot lower, deeper level of analysis than what could typically fit in a business book, right? And the reason why that is, uh, uh, is, you know, we can debate this a little bit, but roughly most reasonable folk agree that sometime around 2015, um, we've produced more information in a singular second than we have in the okay. all the combined times of previous history, like 2,000 years, 5,000 years of previous history, we doubled the amount of information we've produced in the previous 5,000 years in a singular second. And that happened in 2015, right? And so what do you suppose happened after that? It's not like we stopped producing information. <laughs> It's not like we stopped producing novelty and complexity. It's not like we stopped speeding up time. And in this instance, I'm not measuring time in seconds, but rather time in uh, the number of information bits per second, right? Um, and what has happened is that the time has sped up, the complexity has increased, the chaos has increased, the novelty has increased, and the number of variables, therefore, has increased exponentially, right? and it continues to do so. And so the, the problem with a lot of uh, business books, uh, with the problem with my way of obtaining knowledge, let's say, which was through business books, is that they were wholly inadequate for the kind of information explosion that was about to happen. These authors probably had no idea um, uh, what was going to happen. And even if they did, they didn't have experience to convey it. And even if they did, it takes time to reflect on that experience and distill some lessons that somebody else down the road might learn. And so the biggest lesson, uh, I suppose, that um, I could confer to a young entrepreneur is Man, whatever problem you're having, the solution is probably not in the business book because uh, the problems are way too subtle, uh, way too delicate, and just dem demand a uh, much higher touch and deeper thought than the kind of problems that people were dealing with, say, even 10 years ago, but certainly 20, 30, 50 years ago. You know, the times they are changing faster than ever. Yeah, I mean, like... Even like in each new year now, you're just going to see so many more changes like smart speakers. That's a big change. Uh, Self-driving cars is a big change. I feel like these big like 10 years from now, we might be talking like the same way we're currently talking now. We're like and the world's just going so quickly. And I know you mentioned a lot of books, a lot of good names like Ziegler, Carnegie, a few others. Uh, I know you talked about books in the sense that, like, um, <clears throat> like we're not—they're not talking about the uh, information overload and things like that that are uh, part of today's business. Uh, but I am wondering if you can share with us three of those books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. I uh, well, so first one that comes to mind is uh, Clotaire Rapay, uh, Culture Code. Uh, that book. Um, it was. Um, I, I think it's one of the more uh, important books uh, that has that stands the test of time, at least in the short term. The information that's in it is quite pertinent 
And it was in some ways a, a visionary kind of information. Uh, because we are living at the surface of the culture um, at this stage. So um, understanding sort of various culture codes um, is paramount if you're going to define a customer segment, for example. Uh, the second book I'd like to recommend is not a book at all, which is, you know, great. Uh, it's a movie. And it's, a, uh, it's, I think, today it occurred to me, uh, I, I think this may be the most important movie um, of the early 21st century. Doctor Strange, Doctor Strange, yeah, the uh, Benedict Cumberbatch uh, fellow. Um, great movie. And the reason it's great is because it captures the narrative of our times. And the narrative of our times, uh, roughly speaking, I'm sorry? Oh, no, I didn't say anything. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, the narrative of our times, roughly speaking, um, is something like uh, uh, scientific materialism transitioning into magic, which is the, um, spoiler alert, the kind of a broad uh, uh, story structure of Doctor Strange. Um, that's uh, certainly the kind of um, spiritual journey that I've undertaken, um, going from a scientific materialist to uh, 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 someone who's closer to uh, a child who believes in magic, let's say that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, I think the uh, uh, narrative and uh, movie, the, the whole thing is just quite, quite um, prescient um, and speaks to our times and transition we're going through. Um, and, you know... I guess before I, uh, since, since I'm breaking the mold here and not recommending books at all, then let me uh, uh, take break the mold even further and recommend uh, uh, your notebook, your, well, paper notebook, sure, but also your laptop as the third um, book. You know, we have, I, I've had uh, an evolving relationship with, um, uh, computers. You know, when they first came out and I got into them, I wanted to take them apart, see how they work, things, uh, uh, hard things like that, hardware and, and such. And then I wanted to know how to network them, built a whole career around it. And then I wanted to understand how the software of it all works, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but somewhere along the way, I've ended up using it as uh, a thing to tweet with or Snapchat with or whatever it is that you do, right? Um, and I think that's the thing to look out for. So these laptops, these computers, these phones are magical devices. Make no mistake about it. They are magic wands, and they should be treated and used as such. And, uh, you know, there's a good way to use a magic wand and tweeting and Snapchatting is barely that. Uh, but there's other ways of uh, doing it. Um, and maybe, you know, tweeting and Snapchat is for you. Who knows, right? There are different strokes for different folks. But, but these laptops, these supercomputers that we carry in our pockets... Um, should be treated as magic wands, because in, in, in uh, many senses of that word, they are. You can do a lot of magic with them. So those are my three book recommendations. Culture Code uh, by Clotaire Rappé, uh, uh, Doctor Strange by Marvel, and, uh, and your laptop. Well, Dino, those are definitely recommendations that are very different. I'll, no one's recommended uh, Doctor Strange, I know that. But... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> thank you for those recommendations um, oh you're welcome I mean, and I, thanks for letting me play with it too oh yeah well, i mean I, I include those in the show notes so it'll be interesting to see how we do that i mean mm -hmm. i guess it's a doctor strange like place to uh, that'll be fun but um <laughs> it, they will be in the show notes markberry.com slash e278 going a little more of a traditional path um i'll also include content marketing secrets and podcast domination uh, written in 2017 and 2018, respectively. So those deal with the 
uh, information age, and those are also audiobooks for anyone who you like listening to podcasts. You also want to listen to audiobooks. Those are also available as audiobooks. All of that in the show notes. Uh, but before we wrap up this episode, Dino, you shared a lot of great insights with us. Uh, but I'm wondering if you could share with us one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often. Mm, yeah. One question you should ask yourself uh, more often. Hmm. So a lot of ways you, you could take this. Uh, um, my initial instinct is to say, uh, um, oh, here's one. Um, predictability. Um, ask yourself to predict the rest of your day. Ask yourself to predict the tomorrow and the next week, et cetera, et cetera. Like really spend time um, nailing activities into your calendar, because that's a good way to predict what you're going to be doing. Um, they don't have to be meetings. Nobody else has to be involved in this calendar event. It could just be you. It took me 20 years to figure that one out. Um, so <laughs> take it. Um, uh, predictability. How well can you predict today, tomorrow, next week, etc.? Or better yet, uh, realize how bad, bad you are at predicting today, tomorrow, and the rest of the time. Um, and then start getting better at it, you know? Um, and don't, um, don't limit yourself on a single level of analysis, right? It's not about where you're going to be, although that's part of it. It's also about the emotional content of the experience. It's about the intellectual content of the experience. It's about the social content of the experience. Can you predict those things? Better you get at predicting what's going to happen, um, greater the peace of mind, I find. Um, you might be different, but that, uh, that's been a pretty uh, useful practice for me. So um, predictability. Try to predict your today and tomorrow and next week, et cetera. Dino, thank you for sharing with us that great question and all of your great insights throughout our time together. Uh, for anyone who is wondering where exactly can we find you, uh, Dino, can you share with us a few of the places where we can find you on the web? Uh, DinoDogan.com, I suppose, would be one. And then uh, LinkedIn would be uh, the other uh, spot to find me in. All right. Awesome. Those will be in the show notes again, markaberti.com slash E278. Dino, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, thank you for sharing all of your great insights with us on Breakthrough Success. Mark, thank you for having me. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn 